Okay, Rick, uh, let's move on now to the topic that you wanted to discuss. And that is what's going on in the banking sector now. Some people calling it another crisis. Um, I had Frank Trotter on, I believe, last week or the week before, your partner uh, in Battle Financial. And I, I thought uh, he gave a very good explanation of what was going on, at least with Silicon Valley Bank. And since then, the crisis has broadened. Uh, it's gone global. And it certainly has a lot of people concerned uh, for very good reasons. So maybe some opening thoughts first, Rick, since this is the first time that you've, you know, com to my knowledge, you've commented on this in public. Well, uh, two opening thoughts. The first of all is that Frank is a very good guy uh, to have on and talk about it. He's basically a good old-fashioned country banker. He's what you would expect a Midwestern banker to be. He does banking the way Ohio State used to do football, good blocking and tackling. Uh, and, and what's missing, I think, in, in the banking arena is good blocking and tackling. Uh, and I'll get into that. Uh, fractional reserve banking, which is to say uh, banking that isn't fully collateralized, banking that's in fact an insurance function where the equity slice of the bank shareholders guarantees the mismatch between the assets and the liabilities is a, a business that requires prudent management. Uh, it's an important business. The politicians, I guess, believe that it's systemically important. And so the politicians at once uh, regulate uh, it and offer protection to it, in, which is to say subsidize it. I think to the extent that the basic business of banking, wonderful alliteration, has been bastardized. And I think that's where the problem lies. Albert, if you look back at interviews that you and I have done all the way back to the good old days of your power and market report, you will find numerous instances where you and I talked about the systemic risk in the banking business that has come to be recognized. And those risks exist in various places. They exist, I think, first of all, because the risk that the depositors run of the mismanagement of their funds uh, has been uh, to some extent obviated and to another extent exacerbated uh, by regulation by the federal guarantee. Uh, depositors don't believe that they're lending money to banks. They believe that they're lending money to the government. Uh, and what that means is that within um, some broad parameters, that bankers are able to take more risk with depositors' funds than they otherwise would be because the depositors are unconcerned about risk, believing that, believing that they have a put to the Fed. Understand that the aggregate liabilities of the U.S. banking community exceed, by a substantial margin, the resources currently available to the Fed by way of protection. I don't want to scare people about this. But I do want to say that encouraging poor behavior on the part of bankers and depositors is a very, very bad thing. The banking business is a highly leveraged bank uh, business. The FDIC believes that uh, a bank with 7% equity as a percentage of total assets is, quote, well capitalized which is to say that they believe that banks that are leveraged over nine to one are relatively well capitalized. They are relatively well capitalized if they do do anything stupid uh, or if there isn't a crisis of confidence with regards to the depositors that sweeps up the good, the bad and the ugly. But depositors and shareholders need to understand that this is a highly leveraged business which means that in terms of the allocation of capital to assets, that that business needs to be handled fairly carefully and in a fairly risk averse fashion. What has happened in the last few years is that because there have been artificially low interest rates, there have been artificially high spreads between the amount of money that the banks had to pay to attract deposits and the amount of money that they could receive lending out those assets. And further, there have been traditional time spreads, uh, which is to say 
that long dated obligations yielded more than short dated obligations. Banks uh, exacerbated their existing leverage by funding longer term, uh, higher paying obligations with very short term, very cheap money. When we had a rapid rise in interest rates, what that meant was that the capitalized value of those long term obligations fell. And they fell to the extent that the unrealized mark to market losses in those obligations, in many cases, used up the equity slice. Remember that a bank that's capitalized at 7% of total assets by way of equity is considered to be well capitalized. If 90% of your assets or 70% of your assets for that matter are in long dated debt obligations and those long dated debt obligations fall in terms of value because of currently uncompetitive interest rates, it doesn't take very long for those unrealized mark to market um, haircuts to eat up all of your capital. And that's precisely what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. The second thing that happened to Silicon Valley Bank was their reliance on a lucrative uh, but risky form of depositor. Most of the deposits in Silicon Valley Bank didn't come from Albert Liu or Rick Rule or living, breathing human beings that are watching this. They came from venture capital firms uh, or from startup technology firms. And uh, the uh, tech market slowdown and the slowdown in initial public offerings and subsequent offerings meant that the access that Silicon Valley Bank had to new deposits over the last year, two years, dried up. Uh, at the same time that the unallocated funds that venture capital partnerships had dried up and the funds that were in these startup companies began to get spent to keep these companies in organization. So at the same time that Silicon Valley Bank's need for liquidity increased, their access to liquidity decreased. <laughs> they ran into, in effect, the perfect storm. Uh, and, and they ran into it in a form that ultimately was fatal, uh, gave rise to a run on the bank. This run on Silicon Valley Bank has put stresses on other banks that uh, enjoy, if that's the right phrase, some similar characteristics. There are a lot of banks, Albert, and lists of these are available online that have severe time mismatches between the time and rate on their deposits and the time and rate on their assets, particularly those banks that bought, as an example, collateralized mortgage obligations with five or six year maturities. If they bought those uh, bonds to yield 4% and the bonds currently yield 6.5%, what you need to do in terms of valuing uh, the bond is amortize the mismatch between 65 and 4%, which is to say 250 basis points over the remaining life of the bond, which is seven years. Uh, it is not uncommon uh, in that circumstance to see these bonds take a 10 or 12% equity hit. And if you take a 10 or 12% equity hit on an asset class, that's 70% <laughs> of your total asset class, you've wiped out your capital. Uh, and there has been a fair amount of that. The second thing that's happened on a global basis, which is to say, uh, including Silicon Valley Bank, but not exclusive to Silicon Valley Bank, uh, is that we've seen a real dry up in liquidity in the bond markets. Uh, even very, very, very lush uh, and, and liquid markets like the treasury market. So to the extent that banks have had to sell assets, they've had to sell assets in markets that were substantially more liquid than existed two years ago. And you have seen a situation in the last four weeks where uh, a lot of intermediate term bonds have been pushed into a market where there isn't very much of a bid for them. So you have a circumstance where uh, assets 
that would have attracted a small premium in the market three years ago are now attracting substantial discounts, which is to say there is illiquidity in the asset class. Uh, these factors have come together to put uh, in place real stresses in the banking business. The third leg, uh, Albert, I suspect hasn't fallen yet, which is to say that the banking community is now less able to make cash available to refinance existing loans to existing borrowers. We haven't as of yet seen a crisis in collateral around bank loans. But my suspicion is that if illiquidity continues in the banks, which is to say that they need to fix holes in their balance sheet before they can work on maintaining or expanding loans to newer existing customers, uh, I think we're probably due for at least one more shock in the banking system. Uh, Rick, uh, let's start with the beginning. You and I, probably eight years ago on the Power Market Report, I was talking about these problems with you a lot and anyone who was willing to come on and talk back then. And uh, it, I began to see myself as a broken record, uh, maybe a little bit too pessimistic. But what I see here with Silicon Valley Bank in particular um, of course, in retrospect, I guess you can always critique and, and uh, look maybe a little bit silly, but with the Fed talking, and they don't always follow through, but you know they were saying they were going to do this with interest rates, uh, and they were doing it, and for them to leave themselves exposed to that um, makes you think that they were, were they that confident that they weren't going to follow through with this, and, and uh, being unhedged? in the interest rate domain was not going to be a I'm, problem? I'm prepared to say that the people who ran Silicon Valley Bank were substantially smarter than I. I just don't think they were smart enough to do what they did. I would never have tried it. Uh, I think that the Silicon Valley Bank people were at first beneficiaries and later victims of 40 years of easy money. 40 years where there was so much liquidity in the system that investors knowing nothing about technology were happy to value a startup at an infinite multiple of revenues. Uh, the whole community that Silicon Valley Bank financed was unbankable by people like me. I'm not suggesting that I should or would compete with Silicon Valley Bank. What I'm trying to say is that when the era of hyper easy money was over, uh, and when Silicon Valley Bank got confronted with a period of rising as opposed to 40 years of falling interest rates, they were unprepared to deal with it, partly as a consequence of their experience of history and partly as a consequence of their own hubris. Um, these guys were extremely smart, are extremely smart, but they existed in a hothouse where somebody turned off the energy. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being smart. And we talked about this at some length, Albert, over the yeah. last eight years. We talked about the fact that in banking and in fact, in investing and speculating, that you ought to limit yourself to what you know and understand. Right. Uh, that if something turns, if something appears to be good, too good to be true, it likely is. Uh, we talked about and have for years reversion to mean the idea that Silicon Valley could go on forever conjuring up wealth. That isn't to say that they haven't created it. They've created it a lot. You've watched it. Uh, but after they got done creating wealth, they began to conjure wealth. And there was simply too much cash in the system. There was too much cash that was raised in venture capital funds that couldn't be spent. Those were deposits for Silicon Valley Bank. There was too much money in tech startups that had no reasonable reason for economic existence. And when the supply of fresh money to those startups ceased, those companies had to spend the money that they had in on deposit at Silicon Valley Bank for survival. The Silicon Valley Bank people, uh, I think reasonably uh, hoped uh, 
that the artificial manipulation of interest rates would continue ad nauseum because they had 40 years of experience that suggested that whenever the Fed ran into trouble, which is to say every six weeks, uh, that they would say something soft about interest rates. But that party came to a halt, as did the bank. Yeah. And, and I think um, you say the, the days of easy money are over. I think we've just taken a pause on that, Rick. And a pause, a glitch, is all it takes to bring down the house of cards. Uh, your comment about uh, you know, smart people over there, I have no doubt, no doubt that they're, they're very smart people there. But uh, I spent a, an entire career, Rick, watching smart people have their heads handed to them over and over again. That's the consequence of being on the edge. But the difference is, in my line of work, we only hurt ourselves, meaning when we failed, um, it was our own, you know, prospects that were damaged. We didn't start bank runs. And so here you have uh, what started as a bank run, what's, what, what started uh, a series of bank runs. And going back to your football analogy about Frank Trotter uh, being a classic X and O's blocking and tackling, in today's fractional reserve banking system, you can get away without having blockers is essentially what they're saying. You're going to have six people on the field and still play a game. Um, so these other banks now that are in trouble, um, I guess, I guess many of them do have similarities in terms of the large depositor base or, or uh, Silicon Valley or California footprint. Um, but the greater issue is <laughs> just that if everyone runs for their deposit, it doesn't matter what bank it is, uh, they're going to be in trouble. I I isn't that the issue we're facing now? I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that there's enough depositors left that are rational, uh, that will feel the need to put money in a solvent bank, irrespective of the Fed's guarantee, that banking will continue to be a very good and perhaps a better business. There are businesses like First National Bank of Alaska, or Farmers and Merchants Bank of Long Beach, or my own Bank of Hemet, uh, that don't have a 7% equity slice. They have a 14% equity slice, or a 19% equity slice, or a 21% equity slice. These same prudent banks generally <laughs> loan to businesses that they know and understand. Uh, and these banks, in my experience, slavishly match liquidity uh, in terms of the time frame around their deposits and by the way the yield on their deposits with what they invest in, which is to say, in the case as an example of Bank of Hemet, if they're making a five-year floating rate uh, semi-permanent fixed mortgage, uh, they're trying to offset that by selling five-year <laughs> floating rate certificates of deposit to bond buyers. Uh, in other words, there's no requirement that bankers be either aggressive or stupid. And my hope is that the circumstance that's occurring today causes more and more depositors to understand that there are real risks. When you loan money to a bank by way of a uh, a deposit, you are an unsecured creditor to what is in effect a regulated hedge fund that's leveraged nine to one. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with this because banking, taking credit spreads and interest spreads is an extremely good business if you do it correctly. <laughs> Repeat, if you do it correctly. Repeat, if you do it correctly. And I think the obligation is on the investor to determine for himself or herself whether the people that they are lending money to by way of being a depositor are doing it correctly. And by the way, whether they are being compensated for the risk that they run. Bank depositors need to be consumers. I went into, about a month ago, a branch uh, of a big financial supermarket and I visited with the manager of this branch. She was a highly, highly um, nice person. It ended up that she had 14 savings products in this bank. And when I pressed her on the details of various savings products, she had to point me to a white service phone, uh, I guess to connect me to India or someplace where there was somebody who knew something about these deposit products. And as near as I could tell, five of the deposit products allowed me to deposit money with the bank and not earn interest. Return-free risk. Uh, 
uh, what benefit to me was this branch that had a very nice manager who didn't know anything about her products? And what possible advantage to me as a depositor existed from 14 products, which the bank couldn't understand, five of which didn't pay me any interest? I'm not doing this necessarily to criticize the bank. Their job is to make money for their shareholders, among other things, but rather to point out that people in my circumstance, when they go into a bank, ought to understand something about the process, ought to understand something about the product, and they should, they certainly shouldn't select a checking account that doesn't pay them any interest. This is just stupid. And there is probably a trillion dollars washing around the U.S., banking system where the depositors aren't getting paid to take risk and they're lending money on an unsecured basis to a highly regulated over leveraged hedge fund. This is stupid. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty clear that m most of those branches appeared to just serve you cappuccinos and make you feel good uh, about the business you're doing and not for any real purpose. And uh, I forget when it was. I was with my kids, and I pointed out that uh, notice how um, the tellers look very different now. Uh, before, there used to be all kinds of security precautions, really high counters, you know, thick glass. Now it's just it's like a Starbucks because there's no money behind that counter. Um, and you'll know that if you if you try to go and withdraw uh, any significant amount of money, uh, it causes well, a big brouhaha it, it, behind the scenes. It's interesting that you say that. I've been told by my branch that if I plan to make a reasonable withdrawal, say a $5,000 cash withdrawal, right. that I have to give them 24 hours notice. Uh, in other words, I have to give them notice to get my money back. I, I, I realize that once I've given them the money, it's only sort of my money. But what you say, uh, which is to say that uh, this cash is only your cash with reasonable notice, uh, is certainly a, a, a very valid description of the branch banking system that we as Americans in, enjoy, if that's the right word. <laughs> right, right. I, um, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted, frankly, that the tellers run less of a risk of being shot by some moron who would like to withdraw <laughs> that which he didn't deposit. Sure. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm, just, uh, I, I, I'm just coming to understand less and less about how I, as a depositor, in some circumstances, of, as a borrower, uh, and the beneficiary of the banking system uh, as it's, uh, you know, as it currently exists. Yeah. Uh, and, and I realize that federal deposit insurance gives millions of Americans who don't want to take any responsibility or control of their financial future uh, some comfort. But I think the people for whom that comfort is intended would do well to read their bank's statement of financial condition. And they would do well, too, to uh, look at the assets available to the Federal Reserve and to the FDIC relative to the total liabilities of the banking system. I believe that the U.S. banking system will survive and thrive for a very long time. But I don't believe that my belief is collateral. <laughs> I, I believe yeah. that the consumer needs to inform himself or herself of the risks that they run both as depositors and as taxpayers. Um, Rick, in this case, depositors suffered no losses, uh, even the uninsured ones. Uh, I'm wondering, what, what would you have done? Because this is a, a really difficult problem to solve. On the one hand, if you don't respect limits, why have limits? But on the other hand, if they didn't bail out all the depositors, it certainly would have spurred a broad bank run uh, that would have just destroyed, you know, a large swath of the banking sector. So what was the right thing to do in the, or the smart thing to do? I think what Rick Rule would have done is, and it would have been ugly, uh, I would have maintained deposit insurance up to $250,000. And I would have said to the larger uninsured deposits, twist. Now, the truth is that they wouldn't have had to twist for too long. Uh, the franchise around Silicon Valley Bank, uh, which is to say the expertise with regards to the ecosystem in Silicon Valley is attractive. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, there is ongoing concern value around that business. J.P. Morgan Chase would have taken that business at some price. Uh, and there probably could have been a, a bailout that was a private sector bailout to attract the deposits, much as has occurred with First Republic Bank since. The truth is that the depositors at Silicon Valley Bank are an extraordinary, po extraordinarily powerful group of human beings. Um, and a, a group that I would suggest have probably made billions of dollars in campaign contributions. Right. Frank pointed that out. Uh, yeah. Albert, where you two have um, uh, emailed your representative in Washington, you would have got an email back that said, thank you so much for your communication. The participation of citizens in a representative democracy is the core of the democracy, and we thank you for your input. <laughs> Stop. When the people behind Kleiner Perkins or Elon Musk uh, or whoever gives all the money to Dianne Feinstein, let's say the Getty family or the Haas family, right. sends that same email, they get a call back immediately. Yes, sir. How can we help? What is on your mind? You've done so much for America by way of campaign contributions. <laughs> what can America do for you? So, uh, you know, the idea that the rationale behind the bailout had everything to do with investor confidence and nothing to do with the campaign contributions that emanated from the uh, depositors of the bank is at best naive. Yeah. Um, Having I done the bailout, yeah. uh, frankly, had uh, the people at the Fed. And, and by the way, I, I, I deal with the people at the Fed. I deal with the people at the FDIC. There are highly competent, highly honest people in those institutions. But understand that they're directed by politicians. Had those institutions said to the United States, depositors conventional depositors within the limits of the FDIC are completely guaranteed. The equity of American banks, if you compare them now to 2008, are infinitely better, probably 40% better. The banking system, in terms of its breadth, uh, breadth and width, is very solvent, and we will see that it continues to be solvent. Depositors above $250,000 need to understand that those guarantees don't apply to them. Uh, and those deposits need to be done in institutions where the mismatch in terms of time and rate between assets and liability are much more carefully managed. Ironically, those mismatches are the least in small, well-run community banks. <laughs> <laughs> rather than in the great big large money center banks. And it would be useful if both taxpayers and depositors came to understand the qualitative difference in depository institutions in the United States. Hey, Rick, for, for the uh, account holders who exceeded the insurable limits, what was the, what was the uh, hurdle or the, or the downside in spreading those around? Was it just uh, tedious or why were people holding such large balances? Uh, I suspect that those people had been lured into uh, a sense of complacency because of 40 years of easy money. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank serviced those people extremely well. And Silicon Valley Bank was an accepted and valued part of that community. Silicon Valley Bank understood in the circumstance that existed for 40 years, how to bank the startup community, how to bank the tech community how to lend uh, venture capital partners money uh, against pledged but not realized investments. Uh, and I think the overall competence of Silicon Valley Bank in terms of banking the ecosystem that they existed in gave the community the confidence, misplaced as it ended up, to have very large deposits in a bank with an ugly mismatch between assets and liability. Understand too, that that ugly mismatch between assets and liability didn't exist two years ago. 
uh, when the Fed became less involved in artificially low interest rates and began to let interest rates rise, which really occurred only over the last two years, uh, that's where that mismatch was created. But the risk was always there, right? The risk was always there. And you and I have talked about that for years, Albert. Yeah. The great sin of banking is yeah. borrowing short and lending long. Yeah. Now you say That's 40 what years. That's down the SNL business. I was going to say, Rick, you, you, you say 40 years, which is true, uh, if you, the general trend. But it's not like we haven't had financial crisis and banking in, in the interim. I mean, we just 15 years ago, we had uh, a number of banks fail and the, whole, the entire system needed to be bailed out. So they, you know, <laughs> it's not, it's not quite, quite that simple, right? That we've never seen there, anything like this where they couldn't have seen it. There is a tendency in a business where you're able to leverage nine or 10 to one <laughs> to maximize the spread between the amount of money that you pay on deposits and the amount of money that you receive in your investments. And that spread very often includes time. Uh, yeah. and, and if you've been taught in the market that interest rates over time fall, uh, you begin to take more risks than you ought to. It's also true that a business is leveraged nine or 10 to one, needs to take less rather than more risk. Because when you run through periods of illiquidity, even periods as brief as 2008, 2009, those brief periods of illiquidity, if you're leveraged nine or 10 to one, can easily be fatal. Right. Um, okay, so that's, uh, I, I would say that was a, a critical, Rick, but I, I think gentle uh, assessment of what, of what we saw on your part. Albert, I need to say, and this, this really truly needs to be said, in the course now of being involved in another bank startup, Battle Bank, I've had the uh, truly pleasure of being grilled at some length by employees of the Fed, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency, <laughs> and uh, uh, the FDIC. And I'm uniformly impressed with the quality of people in those institutions. I'm not impressed with the job that those institutions have to do because the job that they have to do gets described by Congress and the senior bureaucracy. My suspicion is if those organizations became employee run, <laughs> that they would be much, much, much better institutions. Right. I mean, it's a job that has to be done in the sense that wh whether it's government or not, uh, you, want, you want oversight, obviously. Uh, so you I get do. where you're coming you from. You want adult supervision. And prior to what I've just been through with Battle Bank, I would have suspected that the level of adult supervision that existed among the employees of those institutions would be quite low. That's wrong. It's quite high. What they're being asked to do, the politicization of regulation and the subsidy of banking shareholders by Congress is where the fault lies. Right. Right. Um, so I, I had one question I want to ask you about Credit Suisse, and then let's move on to, uh, I guess, uh, maybe things people can do uh, in the current environment or um, actionable stuff. Um, we saw Credit Suisse fail. And uh, one of the things I remember from the last banking crisis, when everyone was trying to figure out what to do and to prevent it from happening again, uh, they came up with this new class uh, of bonds, the COCOS, the contingent convertibles. And I thought, well, that's... It. And, and I remember the demand for them was pretty high because the yield was pretty high. And I yeah. remember thinking, oh, that's a clever, uh, I guess, manipulation of the requirements. So you have, you know, bonds that under duress, under st stressful times can be converted to equity and the bank could stay solvent or whatever. It sounds sounds all good. And so that that's what happened, which is not a surprise. But What's kind of surprising to me is that the equity didn't get wiped out and then these things still got converted. And if I was a holder of one of those, I think I'd be talking to my lawyer right now saying, what did you not explain to me? Uh, because this is very confusing. You know? Well, I, I certainly hope that there is legal action around the COCOs, uh, if for no other reason uh, than to ensure that similar securities sold in the future have provisions uh, 
that will at least explain in the event of liquidation the order of preference. Now, the fact that the payout to equity holders occurred in priority to the COCOS holders is probably explained politically. I'm talking above my uh, expertise here, but I do remember as an example in the bankruptcy of General Motors uh, that despite the fact that various classes of creditors, in particular the employees' pension funds, had been contractually subordinated to the bondholders, in bankruptcy, because the employees of General Motors were more numerous and better voters, the contractual subordination of the pension fund to the bondholders was obviated by the court. Uh, I happen to think that the court perpetrated fraud. And it wouldn't surprise me if the liquidation of Credit Suisse, I call it Debit Suisse, <laughs> but the liquidation of Credit Suisse uh, wasn't similarly politically ordained. And I hope that this liquidation is contested in court by the bondholders. I understand that the bondholders signed up for contingent risk, but it's very difficult for me to believe that the subordination agreements in the bonds included the bondholders being subordinated to the equity holders. Right. I think that there was a political accommodation because they were afraid that the equity holders uh, would <clears throat> uh, delay the uh, rescue of the bank by UBS and as a consequence had to be bribed for two or three billion dollars. Uh, and I don't know that that's the case. I'm talking off the top of my head. But I can't believe that there was a subordination agreement in place with the bondholders subordinating them to the interests of the equity holders. That's a stretch too far for me. If it is, they sold $17 billion worth of bonds to morons. Right. Right. Okay. Um, wow. So I, I think um, I think we are in agreement that um, in, in the sense that as bad as this looks, um, they, they can the system can survive, right? Uh, depositors are safe. Some some equity holders got wiped out, but um, you can see what they're doing here to stabilize the system. Uh, the big losers are, are going to be people who hold cash and the, just the inflation, right? That's going to continue and maybe accelerate. Um, those, will, those will be some of the losers. Legitimate participants in the economy are going to be losers. Uh, there is going to be a, a, a situation for six or nine months where legitimate borrowers are frozen out from access to capital because the banks are going to be too busy repairing their balance sheets. The regulators are going to be kicking their ass, saying, don't get us into the spot again. And the consequence of that is that somebody who needs a two and a half million dollar revolving credit facility for cash flow purposes to increase their business and employ more people isn't going to have access to that cash. And that's a tragedy. And responsible institutions, small institutions that make prudent loans, that pay real interest to depositors, uh, are going to be penalized too, because these bank uh, bailouts are going to come from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which is going to have to raise rates on the money that legitimate institutions have to pay to bail out illegitimate institutions. Uh, so there are real victims, uh, and the real victims will be the people that are listening to this show. They just won't feel the way that they're victimized directly. Right. So you think it's going to flow through? We'll see it flow through directly to jobs. We'll see it flow through to GDP productivity. We'll see it flow through to deposit interest rates because legitimate institutions will have to pay more for insurance. You'll see it flow through to the access to credit. You'll see it flow through to economic growth. You'll see it. You'll see it flow through the entire economy. You just won't feel it directly. I mean, it sounds like if you're a business owner, you and you rely on credit, uh, you will feel it directly. And a lot of people you here absolutely will feel it directly. Yeah. Now, perversely, from my point of view personally, this is a wonderful thing. Uh, I mean, I'm in the process of backing people starting a new bank. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, being able to provide 
uh, access to credit, which is to say to be able to steal market share from institutions that are unable to do it, to be able to offer deposit products from an institution that isn't victimized by a time spread. <laughs> For me personally, this is a wonderful set of circumstances. I'm not worried about Rick Rule, banker. Rick Rule, used money salesman. I'm worried about the living, breathing people who are listening to this podcast. Um, how do you see this flowing through, let's get topical here, to uh, resource investments? What's in the short run? What, what's the immediate impact going to be or what has it been? Well, in the immediate short run, uh, you'll notice that the Fed did raise interest rates today. Uh, 25 basis points. If the contagion spreads and the Fed is forced to blink, uh, obviously we've seen some quantitative easing. They came up with $200 billion to shore up the banking system without borrowing it and without raising taxes. That's QE, right? They counterfeited. That's what they did. If they go back to a period of counterfeiting and artificially low interest rates, I suspect that gold investors are going to be thrilled. <laughs> uh, you know, what makes gold investments work is negative real interest rates. Uh, it is a lack of faith in other forms of savings and investment instruments. And there is nothing that should challenge faith in savings and uh, investment assets like negative real interest rates paid by insolvent institutions. So to the extent that the policy response to this crisis is the same as the policy response to prior crises, my suspicion is uh, that uh, investors in precious metals will do very well. I do believe that you are going to see a, a continued period of tighter money uh, without interference, which is to say that interest rates will rise to reflect underlying inflation. And that as a consequence of that, you will continue to see the prices of long dated securities, long dated bonds decrease. Uh, which will mean softer debt markets and softer equity markets, which will mean that, as an example, small mining companies, uh, absent a rapid increase in the gold price, uh, will have less access to cash than they had in the past. For those people who provide cash, people like me who participate in private placements, the fact that money is tighter is a good thing. If you're a provider of capital, you'd like to see capital priced more highly than would otherwise be the case. For many people in markets who require a systemic increase in securities prices, that is, people who perversely uh, want a lower cost of capital for issuers, for the psychological gratification that liquidity provides, these will be very tough markets. Um, got a question coming in from Timothy. Um, his personal situation is he has a structured annuity payout for the next nine years. Um, what kind of questions should be he, should he be asking about his uh, financial institution or the um, you know wh wh whoever is responsible for these annuities um, to to I guess feel good that he's not going to get caught up in the contagion of this? Well, that depends on the provisions that he signed when he bought the annuity. It may be too late <laughs> for him. Uh, I, I think at the very least, he needs to ask the financial institution for a statement of financial condition, which they are requ required by either the FDIC uh, or the SEC to provide. Uh, the second thing that he or she needs to do, depending on who the questioner is, is make inquiry uh, in, to the firm that issued the, the annuity, that is to say, the obliged party to provide information with regards to the securitization of the collateral behind the annuity. What is owned? What, if any, are the mark-to-market losses? What are the provisions? What are the make-good provisions around the corpus of the annuity estate to ensure the timely discharge of the obligations by the obliged party, which is to say the insurance or the annuity issuer, uh, and the beneficiary. These are all things that the issuing institution is required to provide. There may or may not be anything at all that the annuity recipient can do 
to safeguard him or her after they've made the deposit necessary to buy the annuity. Rick, when you ask an institution for a statement of financial condition, it, are they going to give you something that is uh, current uh, end of quarter or end of month, end of day? Like, current, what are you going to get? Current, current in the quarter. Uh, but they will give you enough information to ask further questions. And if they don't answer the questions, Albert, you need to, boy you need to boycott them. You have known me for a long time. And although you weren't working for me at the time that uh, I set up Global, you were uh, working with me at a time when I changed clearing agreements with clearing banks. And, and we reviewed the balance sheets and income statements of, if my memory serves me well, 14 clearing institutions. And despite the fact that financial service company balance sheets and income statements are my avocation, in other words, despite the fact that I actually enjoy reading all of that obfuscatory nonsense, uh, of 14 institutions that I reviewed, I only understood the financial statements of three of them. Um, I probably spent 60 or 70 hours with a lot of experience understanding the balance sheets of companies that I was prepared to trust my clients' capital to. It's odd that when a consumer goes to buy a television, you know, a $400 item, $300, I don't know how much TVs cost because I don't buy stuff like that. But it's odd that when I talk to people who do that, they'll spend three or four hours consulting consumer reports. <laughs> and then they'll buy $100,000 worth of stock or make a $200,000 deposit or buy a million dollar annuity. And the whole due diligence has got a hunch bet a bunch. Uh, it's odd to me, Albert. Well, Rick, well, I mean, what happens if you can't plug your gaming console into your computer because it has the wrong <laughs> port? That's a disaster. Uh, okay, uh, we're running out of time here. So I'm gonna slip in one last question, uh, Rick. That's from uh, Jean. She's just asking about uranium. Uh, stock's getting smashed right now. Um, yeah. What's going on? What is this related or what are, you, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think it is related. Uh, I think that we're in a risk off period. And there's nothing in the world riskier than small mining stocks. Uh, and so we have a circumstance where the big institutional investors, many of them are now being asked to fund redemptions, which is saying a run on a different bank. <laughs> At the same time that individual investors risk appetite is fading. For me, this is a wonderful circumstance. If the value of the companies, which is represented by the share certificates owned by the person who asking the question is unchanged and the prices are lower, that means the access to opportunity is cheaper. This is a wonderful thing. Uh, remember that Buffett and others have said that you make money by being brave when other people are afraid and afraid when other people are brave. If in the case of uranium, you believe in the uranium narrative and, and that you believe that the upside in the uranium narrative is reflected in the business of the company that issued the shares, the fact that the shares went down in price is very good, however unnerving it might be. Just as in today's discussion, Albert, we have asked investors to understand something about the institutions that they made deposits in. We would ask too that shareholders understood something about the industries that they were investing in and the companies that they were investing in. I personally am delighted by the malaise in resource equities because I understand something about the businesses and I understand something about the companies in that business. And for me, despite the fact that I'm at age 70, uh, I'd like to become richer, which is to say that the access to opportunity uh, is getting better as the shares get cheaper. The confidence that allows me to say that is the fact that I've done the work. And the person that asked you the question needs to ask themselves, do they know enough about the Iranian business to be invested in it? And do they know enough about the companies to form an opinion about valuation so that they become comfortable rather than uncomfortable when the price of opportunity falls?
Yeah. This has given me a wonderful chance for a commercial, Albert. (laughs) Uh, People who intend to participate in these talks would do very well to attend our boot camps so that they come to possess enough knowledge that they can be comfortable rather than uncomfortable when prices fall. It seems to be that $99 is a very good price for peace of mind. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, most most people here uh, within the community attended uh, the silver or the uranium or both boot camps are very, I think, familiar with the value we we strive to bring every time. Uh, 99 is a great price, but uh, if you're in the community, you can get 15 percent off of that by using the link in the community. So please do that. Um, also want to talk about July, Rick. I uh, saw an email come out recently. Bill Bonner is going to be featured this year in Boca Raton. So you want to talk a little bit about about that one? Well, um, I I happen to love that conference. I love virtual conferences too. Don't get me wrong, Albert. But there's something about a physical conference. There's something about being present with the people that you're trying to teach. There's something about being able to watch their faces when you're talking to them and see whether you're getting through or whether you're putting them to sleep. That's gratifying. This will be a four-day conference, uh, and people who aren't prepared to work hard for four days should not attend. This is not an entertainment event. This is an educational event. But we will have, with your help, uh, access to some of the best gurus, the big-picture thinkers in the world, and not the kind of big-picture thinkers who run for Congress or speak to you through CNBC, but rather the Bill Bonners of the world, the Jim Rickards of the world, People who present the world differently, but from my point of view, correctly. More importantly than that, though, Albert, we'll have access to some of the best analysts in the world. So that if you form an opinion with regard to the big picture, you can actualize it in your own portfolio, provided that your portfolio is interested in natural resources. More importantly than that, however, uh, we will have, as we have for the last 25 years, The living legends, people who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch and can talk to you about where the rubber meets the road, how the lessons that they learned building multi-billion dollar companies makes them better resource investors and what they learned that can make you a better investor too. In addition to that, you'll be rubbing shoulders with five or 600 people who are natural resource investors, five or 600 rich, smart people. The ability that you have to listen to the, all of the information there, uh, that you listen to questions that were dreamed up by others that you didn't have to dream up. <laughs> the people that you meet at the water cooler, the people that you have a beer with on the boat cruise is useful. Finally, having the ability to watch the interaction between the faculty and the exhibitors is wonderful. I had a person tell me four years ago that the ability to follow Robert Friedland and Ross Beattie around the exhibit hall at the Vancouver conference and listen surreptitiously to the questions that they asked exhibitors was worth more than the cost of admission. Remember that all of the exhibitors at any uh, rural investment educational forum be it virtual or online, are owned uh, by the employees, which is to say that every exhibitor that we have is vetted. That doesn't mean that the stock of every exhibitor will rise after the conference. What it does mean uh, is that we understand the exhibitors well enough that we have invested our own money and our own reputation in them, which is important. And know finally, Albert, that if you subscribe to or pay the fee to attend the conference, I can't give you back four days of your life. But if you don't feel that the fee to attend the conference uh, didn't give you uh, enough benefit to justify it, I'll give you your money back. The financial risk associated with any educational product put up by Rural Investment Media is borne by me. Um, this year is going to be uh, another great year. Robert Quartermain, I heard, is going to be joining live this year. So uh, check that out. If you're in the community, uh, type Boca uh, 
in the search bar and then you will find a coupon for a $50 discount there. Rick, we went over time, but uh, really enjoyed this week. Um, as we spoke before we went live, we're going to be doing this a lot more, trying to get more questions, Rick. We got questions piling up from all of the members here. Uh, a little overwhelming, actually, but we're going to get through them uh, in time. So thank you for that. And uh, see you again next week. Uh, I look forward to that, Albert. I think that we should institutionalize these Q&A sessions, given the amount of questions that are backing up. Uh, the only limit is, um, the, you know, your, your willingness to work and my willingness to work. And given the last 10 years, I would suggest that that's unlimited. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's face our audience. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and we'll see you back uh, next week.